Welcome to the 8th Science Industry Roundtable organized by the European Lime Association. As you know, the topic of this roundtable is masonry and Eurocode 6, aiming at preparing ourselves to the discussions of the national annexes of these standards. For evident reason, you, reasons, you know that um, this cycle is organized virtually this time. Actually, it is a cycle of five sessions, and today we are in the middle of the cycle with special session two. Special session two is on the impact of formulation. Special session one was in January on the mortar masonry bond. Special session three will be on execution and quality control and is now fixed to take place on March 31st. I have the pleasure to announce two presentations today on two PhD works performed on the impact of Lyme on masonry behavior. The first presenter is Mira Ramesh, who will be presenting her PhD on a multi-scale approach to the study of lime cement mortars in masonry performed at the University of Minho in Portugal in the group of professors Miguel Azenia and Paulo Lorenzo. She's just about to finish her PhD. The second presenter will be Professor Pete Walker, who will present the PhD work on creep mechanisms by Stella Kiwi, later Macaria. Pete Walker is Professor of Innovative Construction Materials in the Department of Architecture and Civil Engineering at the University of Bath. He has been director of the BRE Center for Innovative Construction Materials since 2006. His research interests include bio-based materials and the use of lime as a binder and stabilizer in construction materials. I thank you all for connecting and sharing this session with us. As usual, please introduce your questions in the YouTube channel. And in order to be able to do that, um, please remember that you have been that you have to be locked in um, on YouTube. I'm now looking forward to the first presentation by Mira Ramesh. Thank you, Dr. Peter. A very good morning to all of you. Uh, it gives me great pleasure to be here. The discussion today falls under the umbrella of my PhD thesis, which focuses on different compositions of lime cement motors and the effect that they have on the mechanical behavior of motors and consequently masonry. The work was carried out in the University of Minho under the supervision of Professor Miguel Azania and Professor Paolo Lorenzo. The presentation is structured such that I'll be first introducing you to the topic. Then we'll briefly discuss the research objectives that we had, the materials and protocols that we adopted, and then we'll be discussing the results. First at the level of motors, and then at the level of masonry. And finally, we'll conclude. So as you all know, motor is an integral part of masonry. It contributes to not just the structural properties, but also the aesthetics of masonry. And typically you combine one or more binders, aggregate, which is usually sand and water in varying proportions to obtain different types of motors. And depending on what binder you use, you can have a wide ranging set of properties. Two of the most commonly used binders around the world are lime and cement. And so that is what this research was focused on. Prior to starting this research, we decided to look into the literature and find out what we already know about this topic. And we found that at the motor level, most of the studies were focused on either strength or porosity, which is great because both properties are important. But we found that there was a lot more room to investigate other mechanical behavior of motors. And even in the existing studies, we found that the studies were scattered because different researchers used different materials. And in some cases, though there were trends, there was contradictory information on the trends that were observed. And in general, there was a lack of quantification. At the masonry level, we found most of the studies to focus on the behavior of masonry in compression. 
Again, this is a great thing, but it also leaves, leaves room for investigation on properties of flexure, bond strength, and so on. So globally speaking, there was a lack of a holistic experimental campaign, which covered a wide ranging set of properties and studied uh, what happens to them when you change the proportion of lime and cement in the binder of a motor. And because of this, there was also a lack of correlation in the different scales of study. So the aim of this PhD thesis and today's discussion to an extent will also be uh, to investigate the impact of mixing lime and cement in the binder of a motor and to study how it influences the behavior uh, of motor and masonry. So at the motor level, we had three independent variables, which means we were changing three parameters to understand their influence. One was the lime cement ratio, one was the binder aggregate ratio, and the third was time, because a lot of properties change with the passage of time. The moderating variable that we had was the water binder ratio, which was determined based on a fixed flow table value, uh, 175 millimeters, and we had a margin of plus minus 10 millimeters. And the dependent variables were all the properties that we studied, whether it was Young's modulus or Poisson's ratio or drying shrinkage. Um, of course, we will not be able to cover all of them today. So we'll be focusing on the mechanical strength of motors, and to an extent, we will also be covering the stiffness of the motor and uh, ultrasound velocity. At the masonry level, the research included the type of motor as the independent variable. We had one reference cement mix and two lime cement mixes, which we'll be discussing. And the type of unit was the moderating variable. We chose a solid molded clay brick and the properties that we studied were compressor strength, flexural strength, shear bond strength. We also studied the response of wall panels to cyclic loads under a constant vertical compression. For today's discussion, we will be covering compressor strength and flexural strength of masonry. The materials that we used for this research were airline, CL90S, and for cement, we used cement type one. The aggregates were the particle size distribution of the aggregates was determined on the basis of the limits set in the European standards. It was a silica based sand and it had uh, particles ranging from 63 microns up to 4 millimeters. And the unit that we used, as I mentioned, was a molded solid clay brick and it also had frogs in it. For the protocol of actually casting the motor, we wanted to make sure that the process was robust enough that every time we performed the casting, we would get repeatable results. For this, the first thing that we did was to use preconditioned materials. And what I mean by that is that the lime and the cement were stored in 20 degrees Celsius for at least seven days prior to every casting. For every casting, the aggregate was heated up to 105 degrees Celsius and cooled down. So there was no influence of extra moisture and water was stored in the laboratory where pretty much through the year, the temperature ranged between 25 degrees to 18 degrees or sometimes going up to 16 degrees, but the water was also, the temperature was stabilized. The mixing process that we adopted was according to EN1961, which has four minutes of mixing, including high speed and low speed and all the motors were prepared according to the same protocol. The compaction was done such that the mold was first half filled and jolted for 60 seconds. Then it was completely filled and jolted again for 60 seconds. And finally, the curing of all motors was done according to EN1015-11, which recommends curing in 95% humidity for the first seven days and thereafter in 65% humidity. For the motor level study, at least for the mechanical strength, we had 15 different mixes and we studied them at six different ages from seven days to 365 days. The rationale behind selecting these mixes was uh, to study a wide range of lime cement ratios, but also different binder aggregate ratios. So we studied one is to three, one is to four. We had a few mixes for one is to five, and finally one is to six.
the water binder ratio for every single mix was determined such that it would result in a flow table value of 175 millimeters plus minus 10. So as I mentioned, the flow table value or workability was a very important parameter for us because we wanted the mixes to be actually used on field such that the masons would be happy working with them. And so this was very important to us. However, what we realized was when we removed lime from the mix and we wanted a reference cement mix, we were having issues in attaining this workability. Essentially what happened was bleeding. So every time we would jolt the mix, some amount of water would be expelled. And we tried various things. We even tried using a plasticizer, but nothing seemed to work in the absence of lime. So finally, we figured out that the problem perhaps was that in our aggregates, there were no particles of size less than 63 microns. And to test this hypothesis, we used the same binder, but a river sand from zero to four millimeters, and it turned out to work, it worked out perfectly. So what we did was we introduced a filler, a silica-based filler in our aggregate, uh, which had a particle size ranging from zero to 63 microns. And that is why you see two particle size distributions on the screen right now. This seemed to solve our problem, but by this time we had already studied, we completed the motor level study. So for the masonry level study, we had a reference cement mix and we selected two lime cement mixes, which we had to recharacterize with the new aggregate. So what we studied at the masonry level was a reference mix with composition one is to five and two lime cement mixes with composition one, one, six and one, two, nine. For masonry level studies, we had to construct uh, specimens and so therefore the motor casting had to be done at a much larger scale. So we had batches of around 12 to 13 kilos of aggregate and we weighed all the materials. Of course, the mixes were by volume, but in every casting, we converted them to weight using bulk density. The mixing was done using exactly the same protocol, just in a larger scale. And finally, we employed the services of a professional mason who's been working in the University of Minho for research uh, for around 25 years now. He, was, he constructed all the masonry specimens. In total, for this research, we had over 100 masonry specimens. Now we'll be talking about the results that we obtained. The first set of results we'll be discussing will be at the motor level. So as you see on your screen right now, um, the first set of results we are discussing are mechanical strength. So there are two sets of graphs, one for compressor strength and one for flexural strength. And it seems to be a lot of data, and that's true. So I'd like to draw your attention to uh, the fact that on the y-axis, we have mechanical strength in megapascal, and on the x-axis, we have time in number of days. And the takeaway from the slide is that strength of the mix increases as the amount of lime in the binder decreases, A. B, as we increase the binder aggregate ratio, the strength of the mix increases. And finally, for every single mix, even though there were ups and downs, over a period of time, the strength increased and then it tended to stabilize. Another interesting thing about this slide is that if you notice all the curves on the slide, even though there are ups and downs, they seem to have a similar shape which opens a little bit of room for, or an, at least for an attempt to try and generalize and get one common equation, which is exactly what we did. So now if you look at your screen, you see only two curves and two, or let's say three sets of three equations. The first two equations give you the compressor strength of mix as a function of time only. So all you need to know is uh, at what age you want the strength of the mix. And you need to have tested the mix at seven days of age, because all of these equations are normalized with respect to strength of the mix at seven days. And for flexural strength, uh, the process was the same, but we had only one equation. Whereas for compressor strength, we had two equations. One when the quantity of lime in the binder is more than 50%, and one when it's less than 
The red curve indicates when there's more than 50% lime in the binder. And black is when it's less than or equal to 50% lime. This curve and these equations essentially tell us what a lot of us already knew, but now it quantifies it, which is basically when you have more lime in the mix, the overall gain in strength compared to seven days is higher and the rate of gain is slightly slower. Another interesting thing that we observed was that at any age for any binder aggregate ratio, if you varied the quantity of lime in the binder, there was a way to estimate the strength in the mix because the proportion was, or the relationship was linear. So here you have compressive strength on the y-axis and the amount of lime in the binder on your x-axis. The first graph is at seven days of age for a binder aggregate ratio of one to three. The second one is at 90 days of age. And the third one is at 365 days of age for a binder aggregate ratio of one is to five. We realized that at every, in every single case, the relationship was linear. So this gave us scope to quantify the gain in strength or the loss in strength as a function of the lime in the binder. So we found out that for every 1% increase in lime content, the change in strength of the motor is 1.4%. Similarly, for every 1% change in the binder aggregate ratio, there is a 5% change in the mechanical strength of the mix. When I say mechanical strength, I include compression and flexion. In both cases, our benchmarks, um, we had specific benchmarks because you have to test one mix at least to normalize it. For the case of lime content, we had 90% cement in the binder as our benchmark because we needed at least some amount of lime in the mix to call it a lime cement mix. And in the case of binder aggregate ratio, we had one is to three binder aggregate ratio as the benchmark, because that is the most realistic scenario of a strong mix that would be used on field, because one is to two would be uh, slightly unrepresentative. If we use this method, we found out that for our 15 mixes tested at six different ages, the difference in estimation from this method and the experimental value was on an, on an average less than 10%. Finally, we decided to take this one step further and see if we could ex express mechanical strength as a function of lime content, binder aggregate ratio, and time. Theoretically, what this implies is as long as you know the composition of the mix you want and at the age at which you want to know the strength, you should be able to obtain it. However, we are aware that this is valid for only our given set of materials. So if the materials were changed, the equations would have to be recalibrated. And it would take a while before we could generalize these equations. But it definitely uh, sets the first set of um, steps towards a generic model. We found out that these equations could explain the strength reasonably well up to an error of two megapascals plus minus. And what you see, the graphs on screen are basically predicted values versus experimental values. We also found another way to try and estimate the strength of a mix, which is by using ultrasound velocity. So on the y-axis, you have a function of ultrasound velocity, and on the x-axis, you have a function of density and compressive strength. And we found this to be linear for almost all cases that we studied. Um, I'm sorry, not almost, all the cases that we studied, which means, that at any age, if you can weigh the sample, the motor specimen or the sample, and uh, you know the volume, so therefore you find out the hardened bulk density. And if you are able to find, measure the ultrasound velocity, you should be able to estimate the compressive strength. Again, this is valid only for the set of materials that we have tested so far. Finally, we uh, shortlisted some mixes, three mixes in this case, to also study trends in open porosity. And we found that open porosity decreased. Um, and I'm sorry, open porosity decreased with um, as the amount of cement in the binder increased. And with time, open porosity reduced as well. The values that we obtained ranged between 23% to 27%.
Similarly, in the case of Young's modulus, as you increase the quantity of lime in the binder, we found that the Young's modulus reduced. So basically, a mix with more cement in it would be more stiff or would have a higher Young's modulus. And with time, the Young's modulus increased for all our mixes. The values that we found ranged between 5 to 18 gigapascal. Now to talk about the influence of lime cement motors on the mechanical behavior of masonry, I would like to refresh your memory that we selected three mixes. One is to five reference cement mix, 116 lime cement mix, and 129 lime cement mix. What you see on screen right now is the compressive strength of these mixes. The important thing to observe here is that the reference mix and the mix L50 or 116 had similar strength between 10 to 12 megapascal. And 129 or L67 had almost half the compressive strength. We also studied the motor and experimented with it to find that it had a compressive strength of 22 megapascal and a water absorption of approximately 10%. The IRA was also, or initial rate of absorption, was on the higher side. It was around 3.55. The first property that we studied was masonry in compression. We used the standard EN10521, and we used three specimens for each type of motor. We used the method of displacement control, and we found that the motor did have an influence on the compressive strength of masonry, but it was relatively minor. So between the reference mix and L67, all values ranged between 6 to 7 megapascal. We also used cyclic loads in the same setup that is shown on screen. And we found that once again, if you use a motor with lower stiffness or lower strength, the Young's modulus of masonry is lower. But they seem to be in the same range once again. To discuss this a little bit more in detail, what you see on your slide or your screen right now is L67 is blue in color, L50 is red, and the reference mix is black in color. So we found that between the reference mix and L50, there was a 7% drop in strength, but 13% greater strain capacity. Similarly, between the reference mix and L67, there was a 16% drop in strength, but a 33% greater strain capacity. This, the graphs that you see right now indicate the compressive strength on the y-axis and the normalized strain on your x-axis. And essentially, they show you the difference in uh, using different types of motors and the amount of increase you would obtain in strain capacity. And of course, subsequently, also the drop in strength. We also tried to use our experimental values and compared them with what the Eurocode uh, recommends. The Eurocode recommends an equation which uses the strength of the brick and the strength of the motor to estimate the strength of masonry. And we found that our experimental values, um, when we compared them with the Eurocode values, Euro, the Eurocode 6 significantly overestimated experimental values. We also compared them with the work of an author uh, Koshik, whose work has also been used by several other authors. And we found that in his estimations and the values that he provides, um, the values were underestimated significantly. So we could not find a good analytical expression to estimate the strength of masonry. But uh, the important thing here is that Eurocode overestimated what we obtained experimentally by a margin of 50 to almost 70%. The second property that we studied at the masonry level was flexural strength, which is basically a four-point bending test. And we studied flexural strength in two directions, parallel to the bed joints and perpendicular to the bed joints. There is a recommendation for this in um, EN 1052, part two. We used three specimens for each motor. So we used 18 specimens in total because we had two tests. Once again, we used displacement control and the results that we obtained were as you may now see on your screen. So in the parallel direction, we found that the mixes which had similar strength, uh, the reference mix and L50 gave us similar values of flexural strength at the masonry level, whereas L69, L67 was much lower. Similarly, 
in the perpendicular direction. The mix is reference mix, and L50 gave us similar flexural strength, whereas L67 gave us slightly lower flexural strength. So to compare this again with the recommendations of Eurocode 6, we had to convert the average experimental values into characteristic values. And this was done by dividing them by a factor of 1.5. The important thing here is that all the, rec all the values that we obtained were greater or higher than the recommendations of Eurocode 6, which is good because this means that the estimation of Eurocode 6 is on the safer side. The only one that was not on the safer side was flexural strength in the parallel direction for the mix L67. The other important thing here is that unlike in compressor strength, the impact of line did not show a very clear pattern. What seemed to play a greater role was the compressor strength of the motor itself. So to conclude, what we have shown you in this particular presentation is that we assessed the trends in mechanical strength quantitatively. We found that for every 1% increase in line content, there was approximately 1.4% change in strength at the motor level. For every 1% increase in the binder aggregate ratio, there was approximately a 5% reduction in mechanical strength of the motor. And we obtained good patterns or we obtained consistent patterns in Young's modulus and open porosity as you changed the quantity of lime in the binder. In general, the values of Young's modulus ranged between 5 to 18 gigapascal. And for open porosity, it was between 23 to 27%. Young's modulus increased as the amount of cement in the mix increased. And open porosity decreased as the amount of cement in the mix increased. At the masonry level, we found that while the compressive strength of motor is a good indicator of the compressive strength of masonry, the difference is not too much. And uh, the strength of the brick guided the strength of masonry. This was true for stiffness as well. And the values for compressive strength ranged between six to seven megapascal. For flexural strength, we found that all values were higher in the perpendicular direction, which is as expectable. And um, the results were influenced much more by the compressive strength of motor rather than the presence of lime in the motor. So as an overall conclusion, one could say that if you used two mixes with comparable compressive strength, um, regardless of the quantity of lime present in them, at the masonry level, the properties tend to be similar. I would like to acknowledge um, FCT Portugal for funding the PhD and uh, the European Lime Association for funding a part of the project and uh, this discussion. Thank you very much for your attention. Yeah, we are now waiting for the presentation of Pete Walker. Um, Pete, are you able to connect? I am attempting. Uh, oh, I'm not sharing. I want to share. Forgive me. Just uh, get to share the right. Mm. As a reminder, we will have a panel discussion in the end of um, after the second presentation. Okay. You can see my slides. Yes. Good. Okay. Okay. Sorry for the slight delay. So, um, good morning, everyone. Uh, and uh, I have the pleasure of presenting work completed by my uh, former PhD student, Stella Misharia, who completed her PhD five years ago. Um, but I think um, still uh, is fairly unique in terms of the um, work that she completed on um, creep uh, or in particular was a focus of her work. So um, the aims of her um, 
PhD were to look at um, the long-term movement characteristics of masonry, particularly using uh, formulated lime mortars. So similar to the presentation of Mira, then we looked at or um, mix, finding combinations of air lime and um, SEM1, um, SEM1 binder uh, with the sand mortars. And then also to look at the, uh, by varying the amount of line content, what the benefits and disbenefits of, of this in terms of mortar and masonry behavior. Uh, and we looked both at uh, physical and mechanical properties and also attempted to look at the chemical and microstructural porosity uh, characteristics as well. Uh, but my presentation here is focusing primarily on the reporting the results of the creep and mechanical performance tests. Um, so um, aligned with those aims, um, the objectives specific to what I'm presenting here is looking at increasing line content on the um, performance of the cement line mortars. Uh, the effects of different masonry units on um, mortar and masonry development, uh, both sh uh, short-term uh, tests and long-term creep performance as well, and attempt to compare our, the data with previously published work and um, design guidance as well. So, as I said, we looked at a series of formulated lime mortars using a mixture of Portland cement SEM1 and uh, CL90S air lime um, to look at the, uh, yeah, the effects of high calcium hydroxide content on the performance. Um, and we looked at the creep properties of the mortar as well as, well as short-term mechanical properties and also the creep performance of masonry wallets as well. And so some of the materials we use, we, as I say, we use hydrated lime. Um, we use SEM1 32.5N cement. We use one type of um, silica-based sand uh, from a quarry in Southern England, which is a, um, a sand widely used, uh, established sand um, for mortars and was compliant with the grading uh, requirements. And we also looked at a variety of masonry units, um, fired clay bricks, um, mainly perforated, such as the, the one you see in the, the photograph there in the slide. Uh, we use three different um, fired clay bricks with uh, what we broadly term as high, medium and low water absorption characteristics. As we know from previous research, that the water absorption characteristics of fired clay bricks have a significant effect on masonry properties and on the bond between uh, the brick and the masonry unit and the mortar. We also extended to look at uh, one set of calcium silicate bricks. Um, these are not widely used in the UK, but recognizing that they are more widely used in other uh, European countries. And then we also looked at um, normal weight aggregate concrete block and uh, an autoclave aerated concrete lightweight concrete block as well. Um, so in terms of just to give context, so the masonry unit properties here, first of all, the compressive strengths, and these are, these are the normalized strengths in terms of a standard, and uh, they have been, pre they're presented here in decreasing strengths and classified in terms of the water absorption or described in terms of the water absorption properties of the clay bricks and then the concrete, the calcium silica and the AAC block at the end. So you can see the range in strengths between uh, 48.2 for the highest strength clay brick down to 3.3 Newton square millimeter for the AAC block. And then also we looked at the characteristics of the water uh, absorption, both the initial rate of water absorption, or sometimes called the initial rate of suction, and also the total water absorption. So again, here presented here, this is the initial rate of water absorption in terms of kilograms of water absorbed per, per unit area per square meter per minute. Um, and again, presented in terms of decreasing um, water absorption. So the 
uh, concrete block had the highest initial rate of water absorption uh, down to the uh, clay brick, uh, the low absorption there. And so the, the, again, these ranges are sort of in keeping, I think, with previously reported values. And then total water absorption we established by immersion in water uh, rather than the boil test or other tests. We just immersed in, in um, ambient uh, water conditions in the laboratory for 24 and 48 hours. And in the main, we didn't see a great deal of difference uh, between the um, 24 and 48 hour test. And it, the, the water absorption is a percentage of the dry weight of the masonry unit. So given the uh, low density, uh, high porosity of the AAC block, it's not surprising to see the high water absorption performance or value for those materials. And then uh, we see with the um, other materials there ranging between 14 and 5%. We sought to get, uh, we struggled in some ways to get um, a higher absorption. So we've called it high absorption, but 13% is not particularly a high water absorption unit. And of course, units with um, water absorption properties of 20, 25% for a clay brick is not unknown, but um, actually um, sourcing these in the current uh, market um, proved problematic and maybe a, a historic unit if we had have got a recycled brick or something may have given us a higher water absorption value. So these terms high, medium and low are, are somewhat relative in the context of the um, study. Um, so here are the mortar mixes that we used and we used, um, they are given there in the left hand column of a ratio of um, cement to uh, sand or cement to lime to sand. The first mix had no lime in it. So it was just a ratio of one to three. And volumetrically, um, the, all of them are in the ratio of one part binder, um, combining the, the cement and the lime as the binder to three parts sand by volume um, in each of these cases. And so you, here you can see expressed um, in the water binder ratio by mass. Uh, and we achieved the water binder ratio similar to uh, Mira as well in terms of the flow table value. And so we allowed our experienced Mason to set the um, water requirements. And then we measured, uh, established initially what the water requirement was to get the, the flow table. And the flow table was coming in at around 170 millimeters, as you can see there. And then in the final right hand column is the lime content in the binder expressed uh, as a percentage by mass. So it varied between zero and 60%. So the testing of the mortars, as I said, we did flow table tests and we did these regularly. We did flex, compressive and flexural strength testing and we also did creep testing. Um, so the first two tests are set by uh, Euro norm standard procedures and the last test, the creep test on the mortar uh, was following a procedure by um, my on hydraulic lime mortars, which were uh, on specimens, uh, cylindrical, small cylindrical specimens um, between 18 millimeters and 30, 13 millimeters diameter and 36 millimeters high. So here are just the casting of the um, specimens, uh, a plan view of the standard um, specimens for flexural compressive strength in accordance with the Euro norm. And then here casting the um, small cylindrical specimens for the creep testing. And so here is the arrangement for the creep test. And so we have, you can see the specimens lined up here. We had a series of, we could run eight specimens uh, simultaneously. And then um, we measured the change in height of the cylindrical specimens using um, the transducers located above them there. And the uh, constant stress for the creep test was applied using these lever arms here. And you can see the weights, which can be moved, of course, along the lever arm to vary the stress levels. Um, and the stresses in the, mace, in the mortar test were varied 
according to the relative strength of the the mortars because clearly um some of the mortars were much stronger as we shall see in the results than than the other mixes so as you can see here the uh, the weights are in some cases are, are further along the lever arm than they are in others and so here we will be seeing a higher force and therefore a higher stress on and then for the masonry tests we did compression strength tests and we'll see some photographs in a moment so these are the dimensions of the walls uh, creep tests on the walls as well and the creep tests were uh, undertaken primarily at a, a constant stress of two newton a square millimeter so to, re to, to represent a, a sort of normal service load stress within um, serviceability sort of load stress within the masonry uh, and once cured uh, they were tested in, in a room with a um, steady state environmental conditions again. So here is uh, just a photograph of the um, compression strength test. Um, so uh, you see 750 millimeters high, they only one and a half bricks or 330 millimeters wide. In part, they are the same dimensions as used for the creep tests and the limited width of the test compared with some other arrangements was in part to make the loads that we needed to supply in the creep testing manageable. Um, so as, as, as obviously the length or the width of this wall here uh, increased, then the amount of load to maintain that stress would increase and that did present challenges for the creep testing. And so for the creep test, we house the units in, um, within our structures lab, but encapsulated and built um, a cabin, uh, an insulated air, uh, cabin in which we were able to control the temperature and humidity during the test, which each time ran in a series um, up to um, six months. Um, we, were able to use uh, a lever arm arrangement which had a very e efficient lever arm to get allow us to get a stress of two newton square millimeter into these walls and so the arrangement here in this diagram um, the um, lever arm was fitted back to our strong wall in the lab and then uh, a mast was hung from the free end here and applied the load to the um, specimen there and then for each loaded wall specimen there was an unloaded control specimen identical specimen as well uh, and the walls were um, same as presented earlier 750 millimeters nominally high and 33 333 millimeters wide um, and to measure the displacement rather than using LVDTs because of the long-term nature we used a more sort of uh, um, traditional approach, if you like, of using demountable mechanical or DMEX strain gauges in which these uh, stainless steel pointers are put glued to the surface of the masonry on both sides. And we measured the movement um, as we, uh, over time, uh, incrementally during the period of um, the creep testing. So in terms of the mortar test results, um, here are the compressive strengths, the average compressive strengths uh, from the mortar tests. Um, I haven't presented all of the data for, for brevity in terms of the flexural properties. So just this is the compressive strength of the four mixes, as mentioned earlier, and over um, three different ages. Um, the standard age, of course, for testing um, cementitious product, products is, is, has been recognized as four weeks or 28 days. So just to clarify, the reason why we tested them at 25 days was uh, uh, actually apply the creep load at that 28 day uh, limit. So we tested the material um, three days earlier than the, the, the standard 28 days. But what I think what we see here in a general trend is that the, in each case, the mortars um, had pretty much attained their strength from a great deal of their strength by um, that first four weeks. Um, you can see some 
increase here in the in the higher SEM1, and there is some fluctuation here um, at the 90 days for the 129, um, and then in the lower strength mix, the 1415, which is a, a very uh, weak mix and, and not uh, generally a, a standard reckon, widely used um, material where you've got a compressive strength of, uh, of just one uh, newton a square millimeter for the mortar. And then presented graphically, you can see the um, change in mortar compressive strength with uh, percentage lime content. So as said earlier, there was actually some, of course, some lime in that SEM1 mix from the, some calcium hydroxide from the cement. So this is why it is not presented precisely at zero there. Um, and then we see a decrease in the um, mortar strength with um, the increasing lime content exactly as we'd expect and as previous research has reported and not a great deal of difference in performance uh, at between 25 days and 180 days. Moving on to looking at the creep testing rather than but before uh, presenting um, the results then this graph here just to explain how we presented the results um, shows the increasing strain with time. So creep is um, a time um, dependent movement of the material in response to a constant applied stress. And so what we have measured in each of the specimens is the total strain movement epsilon here as represented by this top curve here. But what we uh, report um, primarily is the creep strain or the specific creep strain. So just to clarify the differences, this is the strain we measured and initially we see an initial elastic strain in the specimens when we actually apply the load. So the difference between these top two curves is the, the deduction of the uh, initial elastic strain due to the application of the load. So this is the time dependent creep strain. Um, and then in the second case, we also um, have, of course, there are uh, environmental, uh, there are other movements of the specimen, which we measured in our control specimens. So there's an ongoing shrinkage of the specimen. So we have corrected the creep strain to um, the total creep strain to the creep strain here, epsilon C is marked for this bold line by deducting the um, environmental um, or the shrinkage um, movement. And then finally, we were presenting um, specific as shown in the uh, on the graph um, is um, uh, the specific strain is um, stress um, uh, normalized by stress, shall I say, in the sense that some of our specimens, the mortar specimens in particular presented here, had different stress levels. And so stress is obviously, the higher the stress, the more creep strain you might expect. So we have corrected that to give some comparison. So this graph here presents the um, creep strain, specific creep strain um, for um, the mortar specimens. So these uh, 18 millimeter diameter, um, 36 millimeter high specimens and First of all, what you can see, I mean, the, the, the test ran for over six months and um, you can clearly see, particularly in some of these specimens, that there's quite a high degree of noise in, in the response. Um, we, in particular, some of these tests, we struggle to maintain um, precisely constant environmental conditions. And so some of this noise um, was as a result of um, environmental changes. We we're able to monitor that because we also did measure um, movement um, of the specimens without any load on to in the same way we did with the, the masonry wall tests. Uh, but we can see here that, you know, the creep strains are, um, the creep is higher as the strength of the material decreases or indeed as the line content increases. So going from the um, 1 to 3 SEM1 mix up to the 1, 4, 15 mix, we can see increasing creep movement 
um, with the increasing lime content. Slightly presented in a slightly different way, here we have the time uh, since loading uh, and uh, the creep rate. And so the creep rate is the slope of the um, curve that you previously seen. And we see that the slope as recognized by the curved form of that is decreasing. So the creep rate is, is decreasing with time. Um, as you can see across there, it, it measured at, uh, presented here at four different uh, time intervals. Moving on to the masonry test, then first of all, presenting the um, the compressive, the short term static compressive strength tests. Then we have um, here we have at uh, different ages um, at 25 days, 90 days and 180 days for the different mortar mixes and then the wall compressive strengths. So we have the mortar strengths uh, in e for each age, we have the mortar strengths first and then the, the wall average strengths. So one thing that we picked out, and I think as, uh, as Mira and others have noted, is that whilst the strengths, the mortar strengths have reduced, say at the 25 days, they're from 31.4 Newton a square millimeter down to 1.1 for the weakest mix the reduction in the strength of the masonry does not follow that trend. And this is, this is well known, the complex interaction between um, the, of the composite between the masonry units and the mortar in terms of governing the mechanical performance of uh, masonry. So the, the reduction in strength is, um, is somewhat le significantly less than the of the masonry is somewhat significantly less than the reduction in strength of uh, the mace of the masonry, which gives um, uh, it illustrates the potential for using lower strength lime mortars and still retaining um, good level of strength in the masonry. And the benefits of using the lower strength lime mortars um, are various, and, and some include, for example, the recycling of the masonry units at the end of life, for example, by using a lower strength lime, higher lime content mortar, there is more opportunity for recycling the units, as well as in terms of looking at the um, movement properties as well. Not to dwell upon this, but we also did a lot of testing on flexural bond strength. In this case, we just used the uh, bond range test. So we didn't look at the orthogonal property, flexural strength properties by measuring parallel and perpendicular to the bed joint. We just did um, perpendicular to the bed joint uh, and looked at, oh sorry, uh, the, the plane of failure is, is parallel to the bed joint, the weakest direction using the bond range test. And here you can see uh, the bonds values, the flexural bonds values and um, the influence of the mortar content on those bond strengths. And seeing again, similar to the to the compressive strength of the um, masonry that the um, flexural bond strength is does not decrease uh, in the same uh, rate uh, uh, in keeping with the change in the um, mortar strength so uh, another way of saying that I suppose is to say that the relative strength flexural strengths of the lower strength um, lime uh, lime mortars uh, were much higher than um, at the uh, higher strength um, mortars. This graph here presents one of sort of numerous um, tests. We, we did a series of tests. I think overall 16 walls were subject to creep testing. So this is specific creep, although in this case, all of the walls were tested at the same uh, vertical um, stress of two newton a square millimeter and shows the creep measured, the average creep measured over um, a six month period for the four walls using, um, so it's using the same uh, medium water absorption clay brick in this case uh, and showing the relative, the specific creeps here for each of those um, four walls. And again, in keeping same with the uh, 
mortar tests, then the creep uh, was higher in the weaker mortars or those with um, higher lime contents. We can also see, you know, there's a the creep starts to the creep rate also starts to level out relatively quick, quickly in some of these um, materials. As part of the uh, research, um, I must coming to the end of my presentation, um, we did look at uh, ways of predicting creep and we compared the um, creep, uh, measured creep with the predicted values from the current Euro code six um, guidance. Uh, and we also looked at it empirically um, predicted by an equation originally um, developed by Ross in 1937, which has been also developed for use in um, concrete and cement materials. And you can see um, the um, predicted values here. And these are for, present for a slightly different uh, range of uh, tests as presented in the pre previous um, graph there. In terms of the predictions by um, the Euro Code 6 recommendations, which is based on um, the masonry unit type and the um, elastic modulus of the material, um, which, we, which we measured, although I've not reported here, um, was able to predict the longer term creep um, within, um, well, as you'll see in the final concluding point here, within about 30% of the value extrapolated from the data. So then some of the, I have not presented any of the work that we did on um, porosity testing or, or chemical characterization or SEM, um, but just looking primarily at the mechanical performance test. So main points here, increasing the airline content, reduce the compressive strength of the masonry prisms and um, the mortars as we would have expected. Uh, and in line with what's previously been reported. The average wall compressive strength is higher than a mortar strength up to up to 10 times for the lower strength um, mortars. So in the sense seeing where uh, the masonry units are important, um, relatively speaking more important and that is reflected in the um, current Euro 6 um, uh, code um, equation for calculating the characteristic flexural strength of masonry as, as Mira reported on earlier. Uh, the airline content in the mortar had a, had, a, had a direct proportional influence on early creep rates uh, and um, for both uh, the mortar and the masonry and was the strongest correlation. So airline content, um, which directly relates to more mortar strength um, was the strongest correlation for both the mortar and the wall creep tests. And we found for, um, that the Eurocode 6 creep values predicted, we only measured up to, uh, I think eight months was the longest period we measured for the wall tests. Uh, but from that, we sought to extrapolate um, the creep strains uh, for longer term. And the, the values were within 30% of what we were able to extrapolate. And I think that's it just to acknowledge and say, yeah, the work was supported by um, Stella's PhD was supported by LUAST and also by the University of Bath jointly. And some of the work was undertaken uh, with LUAST and uh, thank, acknowledge the colleagues there and also at the University of Bath in helping Stella to complete her work. And I think um, that is uh, me completed. So I can stop sharing my screen. And thank you for your attention and I'm happy to take any questions that may arise and I'll do my best to answer them. Indeed, um, Pete, um, there are two or three questions um, concerning your presentation. The first one was maybe to clarify that um, why did you use um, CM52.5 and not 42.5? You, you're on mute, Pete. Yeah, I am, sorry. The phrase of 2020, 2021, you are muted. Um, <laughs> I will have to double check on that because this work was completed five years ago. I don't recall precisely why we did choose to use 52.5 rather than 
Uh, I seem to recall it may have been uh, at the time um, as we wanted SEM1 um, was uh, a supply issue that we were able to get 52.5 and I'm not sure we were able to get 42.5 at the time but I would have to I don't think there was any particular particular reason other than and I think maybe just supply issue. And um, there is um, also, there are two questions on um, the creep testing. Yeah. Um, a first one um, from Paolo Lorenzo. Um, can you clarify the level of stress in the creep tests? What is constant for all mortars? And only, is there only one stress level? In the, in the wall tests, it, they were constant at two Newton a square millimeter. The mortar tests, um, were varied because of the varying, the high variation in the strength of the mortar. So it was, the stress levels were relative to the compressive strength of the mortars. Um, and I can get back to you, Paolo, on the, what the specific values of stress were um, on those on the tests that were reported there. Um, I know um, that the values in that graph were adjusted, well, well they, they presented a specific creep. So they are relative to um, stress level as well. So of course you might expect high, you know, if, if you apply, if we apply the same level of stress to the weaker mortars, we would, we would um, see a much higher creep rate. I mean, in fact, we, we, if we had applied the same stress level as we did to the higher strength mortars, we would have crushed the lower strength mortars. So we had to, I think it was something like 20% of the compressive strength of the, the mortars. We also looked at uh, making, uh, taking back values relative to what these mortars would roughly experience in the wall measurements as well. You know, the, the, the level of stress in the mortars was related back to the stress that the mortars would experience in the wall tests, is what I'm trying to say. So I'm sorry I can't answer precisely the question at this moment, uh, but I am happy to, I can follow that up and clarify. But they were, the mortar stress levels were varied because of the high degree of variation in the compressive strength of the mortars. In the mortar testing? In the, in the mortar, mortar creep testing, yeah. not in the wall testing. Not in the wall testing, no. There is another question, and I think that um, some of us um, would be um, very grateful um, that you re-explain how you identified and measured the different strains during the creep tests. Okay. Um, the, I mean, I can go back and share my screen. Would that help, maybe? Yes. Yeah, okay. Let me, uh, hopefully I can share the right window. Um, so if I, so um, in specific to the tests here, then we, this um, device, which was developed by my colleague, Richard Bull, when he was at um, Bristol University, we have, we are, these are LVDTs and um, they are measuring the reduction in, essentially the reduction in height of these uh, mortar uh, specimens. Um, they're very precise. Uh, they have quite low uh, travel, but um, quite uh, precise um, LVDTs. So we are measuring the height, the change in height of the specimens. Now I appreciate, you know, in terms of static load testing, um, that you, to do that, you would over um, measure the strain. If you were to take, if you developed a stress strain, a static stress strain relation curve and just based it on the platen movement because of the end effects and the effects of the platens, the strain levels you would measure would be higher than if you measured uh, surface strains as we saw um, from uh, what Mira had done, for example, in terms of measuring her strain values. Um, and then for the wall tests, we used um, DMEX strain gauges. And you can see um, pairs of the gauges here. So for those of you um, 
uh, not familiar with the DMEX strain gauge, then essentially we're measuring vertical strain here. So we're measuring change in height. And uh, we did also attempt to measure some lateral strain, but they weren't very successful. So primarily reported on vertical strain. Um, and so we're measuring in a pair across from there to there and from there to there. And um, the gauge is, ha is, has a dial or a digital dial gauge, the more modern ones have, and it, they are able to accommodate the change in distance between those little stale stainless steel points that are glued to the surface of the masonry. And so you're measuring strain here over one, two, three, four mortar joints and similarly one, two, three, four mortar joints there. So they're glued to the surface of the bricks and measuring there. And we measured them in uh, three vertical locations. So towards the edge, mid, mid um, way across the wall and on the other edge there. And we measured them on the other side as well. And we did in the initial testing go to quite a lot of trouble to try and get the load on the wall as concentric as possible. So here you can, there's a load cell here, and then we have um, a stiff steel spreader plate at the top here uh, to um, try and get a uniform stress. And we did um, adjust, do some adjustments. Before, um, so there was some initial loading, unloading, adjustments to get um, a uniform stra strain in the walls um, but it was very difficult to achieve so the strains reported are average strains so we might see some um, greater strains on one side than the other or on one face than the other so they, they have been average the um, variation in strains are reported in the um, PhD and then, I mean, to just to go through this graph again, then we, what we measured on the specimens is this top line here. And then we um, deducted the initial elastic strain that we measured when the load was applied. And then we also measured, um, and you can see um, there was, well, you can't see, but just together with, all of the experimental walls are in here. We had an unloaded specimen, which also had the strain gauges on as well. So we measured the strain due to um, primarily shrinkage as the, as the walls dried out. And so we deducted the shrinkage strain to get the total creep strain here, uh, which would have been as for the case of the um, masonry wall test and the creep strain we reported would be the same as the specific creep strain because the stress levels were um, the same. So hopefully that provides some clarity to what we tried to do. I think so, yes. Um, maybe a last question concerning creep. Um, is there any correlation between the creep of um, the uh, masonry and the mortar? Oh, for sure, yeah. I mean, I think we saw higher uh, creeps as the strength of the mortar decreased. Although, and I mean, even the, the, in the mortar tests, yes, the creep rate was higher in the lower strength mortars. So I think the implications for this are that in designing um, masonry with lower, uh, lower strength mortars, you would expect greater longer term movement and would have to maybe uh, accommodate that. But I think as we've seen traditionally, um, lower strength line mortars are, are better accommodating movements as well. So you might see greater movements, but in terms of um, you know, many traditional line mortared masonry buildings don't have the uh, movement joints that we see in more um, modern masonry, higher strength masonry buildings. Mm -hmm. So for sure, the, um, the more calcium hydroxide you put in the lime mix, the higher the creep strain. And maybe I don't know how the um, question initially was thought um, to be, but 
Um, I suppose that um, it's not possible to do a direct correlation between your um, creep on testing on masonry and the creep testing on the mortar specimen as the loading was not the same. We tried to do similar. that and we, 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 did, we, we didn't get very far. I mean, I, I think with um, more follow-up research, it would be nice to have done more testing on the, on the mortars to establish um, Young's modulus and Poisson's ratio and maybe try to do some modeling. But, you know, the, the stress state of mortar in masonry in the joints there is quite different from the uniaxial stress state that we are measuring in those creep tests. You know, we, the, the mortar is in a more complex triaxial stress state due to confinement of the masonry units. So uh, we didn't see we we weren't able to extrapolate the movement of the masonry walls directly from the movement of the uh, mortar creep test i mean all it did was the the mortar tests and the masonry tests the relative creep values were were similar we could say that yeah mm. Mm. Yeah, maybe um, again, um, I invite the audience um, to, um, to ask other questions. I have some questions, but um, do not hesitate to introduce your questions in the YouTube channel. Um, I have a question to Mira. Um, Mira, um, what you have reported is um, that masonry properties tend to be similar for similar compressive strength. So, what, to your opinion, is the advantage of using lime? Mm -hmm. um, probably in terms of actually making, casting the motor and handling it while construction, the biggest advantage would be uh, perhaps workability. Because uh, in my own experience of casting several motor mixes, as well as the mason who worked with us, we found that um, it's easier to obtain a workable mix when you have lime present in the mix. And as it was discussed in the presentation itself, when we wanted to obtain a reference cement mix in the absence of lime, we found that uh, during compaction or right after casting, the motor started bleeding, which essentially means that there is a layer of separation between the solid component and the water rises separately. Now, obviously this is not good because it influences a lot of the mechanical properties of motors and masonry. So if we can establish that, um, or as we found actually, that um, at the masonry level, if you use two mixes with similar compressor strength and you obtain similar mechanical properties, then what we're looking at is a comparison in terms of workability, perhaps the cost, of using the two different materials. Um, we could also be looking at the carbon footprint of different materials, but um, those would be the advantages in my opinion. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you. Um, but also coming back, um, well, you have been observing similar properties um, for similar compressive strength. Pete has been observing um, a high um, uh, correlation, and is it really a correlation of compressive strength and water absorption of the bricks? Mira has been using one type of brick. So Pete, is this correlation um, between the compressive strength and um, the water absorption of the bricks first order? Or do we expect other, um, it, there's one graph in your presentation where, um, at least for the clay bricks, um, the correlation seems really to be, uh, there seems to be a nice correlation. Is it really as nice or are there other factors? Sorry, I'm due to my questionable Wi-Fi here. I missed the first part of the question. Could you repeat the question? I'm sorry. I, I remember one graph in your um, presentation where you correlate um, the compressive strength um, with the water absorption of the bricks. Yeah. Um, I mean, I don't, I, I think there is a, um, we haven't, we didn't really look for the trends in that, but certainly um, the high porosity of um, the bricks 
um, would correlate, I'd expect, with the compressive strength. So the higher the porosity, I would expect the lower compressive strength. But I wouldn't say it's uh, there is an absolute deterministic relationship that you could, you know, uh, derive an empirical relationship that I'm aware of that you could say measure the the water absorption and therefore determine the compressive strength. I mean, I show the the, the graph is shows it also for different materials. So we're not only just dealing with fired clade units, but we have autoclave units, calcium silicate units and concrete units. And so I don't think we can derive a relationship based on, on, on those properties alone. I mean, certainly there's a, I think there's a, a recognized relationship that the water absorption properties of the bricks are very deterministic for the flexural strength properties of um, masonry. Um, although it, there is still some quite a degree of variation in that. I mean, in, in the uh, national annex for the UK, then we define flexural strength according to a range of um, strengths, uh, water absorption properties of clay, fired clay bricks. So that's why we attempted to sort of characterize them as being low, medium, and high water absorption, whereas in fact, I think even what we've defined as high is probably fairly medium or even low in some circumstances. Um, but yeah, the, the range is below seven, seven to 12 and above 12. And you, the higher the water absorption, the lower flexural strength you would expect for fired clay bricks. And in a general sense, I think our, our results followed followed that, but it's a very generalized relationship. Less so, I think, when it comes to compressive strength of, of masonry. Hmm. For the time being, I do not see other questions um, in the chat. Um, again, do not hesitate. Um, otherwise, um, I think we can conclude this session. Um, thank you very much to Mira and Pete for these very interesting um, presentations. Um, I think it gives a lot of information for what we are aiming to do. On the one hand, um, discussing uh, the parameters in the national annexes. Um, we have seen many details and comparisons with um, uh, with um, the values given in Eurocode. Um, from a formulation point of view, um, Paolo Lorenzo has already stated um, in a past session that um, there are high formulation in, um, in prescribed um, mortars in the national annexes. We observe high, ob um, high differences in the different national annexes. And I think that um, the data given um, in your presentations um, will be helpful to discuss that um, seriously. And um, we also had discussed um, last time, and I see there is one uh, new question. Um, I just can read because um, it, is, it is a statement, I think, from Antonio Caballero. Um, I didn't have the time to read it. I will just uh, read it like it is. Um, he states some um, the advantages might be valid for site mixed mortars. Actually, you see it, but rest assured that manufacturers, manufacturers of factory made mortars formulate their mortars with a view to meeting the technical performances expected. If someone wants to add something, I'm sorry, I do not fully understand it. Um, yeah, um, I think this statement is exactly what I wanted, what I planned to say. Um, we had a statement in our special session one on bond, um, is that uh, we are aware that um, uh, in the bond session, um, uh, water retention has been um, discussed um, very largely. And um, we are aware that um, for special bricks today, um, we need special mortars with, um, with um, well-controlled 
technical performances. And I also hope that um, this session was able to give some information in order to help to formulate these um, special mortars. So um, with that, if there is no other question or um, statement, I would um, like to thank you again for these interesting um, presentations. And um, yeah, I'm looking forward to our session on March 31st on um, execution and quality control, because this also entered in one of Mira's comments on um, uh, formulation robustness and um, robustness of, um, of performing the work. So thank you very much for joining us and I'm looking forward to meet you again um, end of March. Goodbye. Thank you so much.